Welcome and good afternoon to this very first session at the European Health Forum Gestein. And as you have seen, the overarching topic of today's, of the whole forum actually, is health systems in crisis, countering shockwaves and fatigue. And today we'll be in this session looking specifically at primary health care. How can primary health care counter shockwaves and fatigue? How can primary health care lend resilience to the health system, to our health systems in crises? My name is Deepa Rajan. I'm with the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. And this session is co-organized by us at the Observatory, by the WHO European Center for Primary Health Care, and by the Austrian Federal Ministry of Social Affairs, Health Care and Consumer Protection. So before I hand over for the opening remarks to my dear colleague Natasha azopardi muscat I'd like to just go over a few housekeeping issues. So our young Gesteiner, Bianca Kukos, to my left over here, will be managing the Slido. You can access the Slido on a QR code, which I understand will be put on the screen. There we go. So this QR code is for comments, for questions, not only from the online audience, but also from all of you here uh, in the room. That being said, I would much prefer questions and comments from you to come in person, but if you prefer, you have this option via Slido. I will now hand over to Natasha. Natasha azopardi muscat is the Director of Country Health Policies and Systems at the WHO Regional Office for Europe in Copenhagen. She needs no further introductions. I think many of you here already know her. Over to you, Natasha. Thank you, Deepa. Good afternoon. And it's always great when it's the first session on Tuesday afternoon, because people <laughs> are still, you know, full of energy. And I hope also that we can grab a lot of your attention. Today, I stand here before you on behalf of my colleagues uh, who are busy in Almaty uh, preparing for our upcoming international primary healthcare conference, which will be held in Astana in a few weeks' time, commemorating the 45th anniversary of the Almata Declaration, the fifth anniversary of the Astana Declaration, and all of this seems such a long time ago. It's pre-COVID, and so much has happened since then. And of course, we will have to bear in mind, as we meet and convene together, the emergencies that our health systems have been facing over the past three years and how this has shaped them. But actually, we want to move beyond talking about the importance of primary care, and we want to be able to see what is actually happening on the ground and what role is primary care playing. But the conference is not actually just a conference, and it's not about experts talking to one another. We are bringing young people in, and we are preparing a statement this time which is being crafted and developed by young people. So just like the European Health Forum Gastein has the Young Gasteiner Forum, in our primary health event in Astana, we are giving a central role to young people to be at the forefront of creating and shaping the future of primary health care, the system that they would like to work in as health workers, the system that they would like themselves and their future families to benefit from. And in this sense, when I said it's not just a conference, a couple of weeks ago we've launched an online platform and maybe we have a slide also that will um, enable you to have a mental picture of what this looks like, what you should look like. Um, please feel free to use the QR code to register. We are holding a series of virtual roundtables. There are still two more to go, and I urge all of you, if you are interested, it's a fascinating platform. It's got AI also translating into several languages so that people can interact. And this is not just for the highbrow policymakers, it's for practitioners, it's for people. But let me get to the real reason why we are gathered in this room. 
Because, of course, we believe in primary health care, but many times we seem to be falling short of making the principles and the vision a reality. And first and foremost, we must recognize that the tapestry of our global population is woven from very diverse threads, but increasingly, these diverse threads are coming together in the fabric of our societies, even at national, regional, and local levels. And therefore, our communities have very diverse and distinct needs, and this is why we cannot advocate for a single model of care because it is not a one-size-fits-all approach. And we need to ensure that we really understand the state of health of the populations that we are managing. And primary healthcare is very well positioned for this, to be able to tailor the services to the needs of the population at hand. And we will be launching a policy brief in Astana which speaks precisely to the topic of population health management and the role of primary health care in this regard. And of course, the need for primary health care is stronger than ever before. Besides the fact that we have learned our lesson, when we have an emergency such as COVID, we don't shut down primary health care. But actually, we need primary health care to be stepping up, delivering, and being prepared for emergencies. And of course, we also learned our lesson that when we are preparing for emergencies, the mental health response is part and parcel of this package, and mental health in primary health care is so important. And of course, I think one of the key lessons from the COVID pandemic has been, therefore, the importance of having these multidisciplinary teams that can cater for the physical, mental, and social needs of our population. So in this sense also, we need to find a better way to really have this handshake between public health services and primary care services at the community level, as well as with social care too, because when we talk about the European region, it's the oldest region, and we cannot ignore what the demographic situation is and the needs of older persons. So at WHO, we are really working to try and showcase this, but the reality is that the, the, the pandemic the war and everything else has placed a lot of pressure. The reality is that on the ground, we are missing primary healthcare workforce in many areas. The reality is that in many rural areas, whether they are in north of Scandinavia, in the south of France, or in the eastern part of our regions, we need to make sure we have enough qualified health workers and that we prioritize primary healthcare in our planning. We also need to address the fact that distance to major hospitals is often growing as smaller hospitals need to close down because they cannot meet the quality of care standards and we concentrate physical and human resources to deliver specialized care. We also need to find better ways to optimize the use of digital tools because when we talk about digital tools and solutions, many times we think about the large hospitals with all their fancy equipment but actually digital can best serve the needs of those rural populations that are being left behind if we empower and equip our primary healthcare workforce and the people they serve. So friends, the demands on our health workers is something that we will hear a lot about in the coming um, three days. And we will have a plenary actually, which is going to be talking specifically about the health workforce. And we cannot talk about strengthening primary care if we do not put the needs of the primary healthcare workforce at the heart. And of course, we are trying to work with governments to change this and to make sure that the system that they have in place really provides training and really prioritizes primary healthcare. The digital revolution is reshaping healthcare. Let's make sure that we use this also as a lever to bring primary healthcare where we would like it to. So in closing, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to every one of you for your commitment to primary healthcare. I would like to thank our colleagues at the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies who have really worked very hard to pull together what is a primer on the how, the way we go from the vision to the reality implementing primary healthcare. And I 
would like you all to keep in mind to join us virtually in Astana at the end of October to find ways in which together we make this vision that we aspire to a reality by prioritizing the workforce, giving them access to the tools they need and making sure that we can really support and meet the needs of the populations that we serve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natasha, for putting it all in a nutshell. We've got the workforce, we've got the digital rev revolution, we've got making PHC a re reality when there's no single model of care. And all of this, as mentioned by uh, Natasha, will be discussed in the Astana Primary Healthcare Conference on the 23rd of October, where we will also be launching the PHC Primer, the Primary Healthcare Primer, where we've brought together the latest evidence on all things PHC, specifically looking at implementation. And speaking of implementation, we also want to know how does that then work out in practice and how does it actually lend resilience to the system? How can we use the way the, the advantages and the leverage of PHC to lend resilience to the system to counter shocks when they do occur? And the analysis that we've done will be presented uh, by my next speaker, Dion Kringos, uh, who is the Associate Professor at the Academic Medical Center of the University of Amsterdam. She will be followed by, after her keynote presentation by a panel, panel of three esteemed members. We have on the panel Ilana Ventura of the Federal Ministry for Social Affairs, Health Care and Consumer Protection here in Austria. We have Margarida Cruz, who is a civil society member of the National Council for Health in Portugal. This is a, an advisory body to the Ministry of Health, which has a specific mandate to bring civil society and community voice into health policy making and planning. And so she's one of the civil society council members. And then we have Johannes Singer, who is a frontline physician, general practitioner in a primary healthcare unit on the outskirts of Vienna here in Austria. So we'll have a panel with a civil society voice, a practitioner voice, and a policymaker voice. But we'll first start with our keynote presentation where Dion Kringos will lay out how does primary health care lend resilience to the system. Tell us all about it, Dion. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, online viewers. It is a great pleasure for me to present to you in a few minutes the how, through what mechanisms is primary health care foundational to the resilience of health systems. Now let's see, yes, technology is also with us today. Uh, my speech will be based on two key publications. One was just mentioned, which is the book, The Primary Healthcare Primer on how to implement the primary healthcare approach that will be launched next month um, in Almaty. And the other one is the, the Euro Health issue on health systems in cri crisis that is launched today here at Gastein, which has a dedicated article uh, led by DIPA on uh, the role of primary health care and how it is foundational to health system resili resilience. So the Astana 2018 declaration provides a very comprehensive definition of primary health care. It, it centers around the health and well-being of not just individuals but also populations and that's essential. It takes a very holistic view on uh, prevention, promoting health, treatment, rehabilitation and palliative care. And it basically uh, provides you three key components of, uh, of a primary health care approach. It is centered around um, multidisciplinary policy and action, engaging communities and populations, and provided integrated service delivery by integrating primary care services with the fun foundational functions of public health. Now, it has become uh, well recognized by policymakers, practitioners, and academics that primary health care has a key role to play in health, universal health coverage and people-centered health systems. But too little attention has been gone through its vital role for the resilience of health systems and for health security also in times before a, perhaps uh, a pandemic or another crisis like climate change or an economic uh, disruption takes place. So also in the prevention phase of crisis, the health security role of primary health care is essential. Now with resilience, it will be a term you will hear uh, 
probably many times uh, in each session, but it has to do, of course, with the re adoption of health system, how it can cope and effectively react, respond, but also learn and adapt from crises. And crises, yes, we've just, we are now in the aftermath of a pandemic, but a crisis can take many shapes and forms and perhaps some are even unknown to us. So we always should be prepared and, and um, to, in order to prepare and to respond, but also to learn and adapt from it. And primary healthcare has an essential role. In the preparation phase, it is providing and catering to all the broad range of health needs of population individual, so to assure and foster health security. During crisis, primary healthcare, and we've seen that during the pandemic, is at the front line and responding to all sorts of health needs of populations and communities. It is innovative, it has been a motor of innovations, and it is also learning and adapting and providing in a very flexible way uh, continuous changes to the health needs. And, and after, after now, in the aftermath of a crisis, it is essential to sustain the innovations that happen during a crisis and to learn and to adapt for, to, for contributing to a future-proof health systems. The, me the mechanisms, the key mechanisms through which primary healthcare plays such an essential role uh, to resilient health systems comes down to the pillars of the Asana Declaration, the pillars of uh, integrated service delivery to public health and primary care, to the service delivery through multidisciplinary teams and by empowering people and communities. Now let me go one by one through each of these key foundational uh, components. Community engagement and engaging populations is essential. We've seen, the evidence is very clear, and we've seen examples on COVID that it is conducive to building trust. For instance, trustworthy communications to particular populations group can happen through organizing your communities. It also is conducive to um, building resilience and to empower communities to learn uh, and to engage and to prioritize vulnerable populations to mitigate the exposure to health risk and to, and, and as, in essence, to mitigate and reduce the risk uh, for health inequalities and inequalities in excess. However, we have seen that it's quite difficult to embed the perspective of civil society um, in, uh, in government perspective and policies, but luckily there are great examples in doing so. For instance, in Ireland, we've seen that the travelers community organized themselves well teamed up with local governments in order to improve vaccination reach. Because especially when the government reach during crisis is low in certain area, it is where community engagement plays a key role to reach out and sometimes to take over and organize care and adapt to the health needs of particular uh, communities. Looking at the multidisciplinary teams, multidisciplinary teams has, are such a powerful vehicle to provide holistic care to populations. It unites mental health workers, physiotherapists, social care workers, general practitioners, nurses, providers of all sorts of range that together can provide uh, holistic care to population needs. Um, it is through these, this comprehensive scope of services through the long-term relationships with people and populations, and also through the collaborative spirit that they have in working together, is that it makes them so adaptable and flexible. And we've also seen recently in the pandemic that they also have skills to adapt and to expand their roles during crisis. We've seen community health workers, community pharmacists in the US, the UK, and Ireland to take up additional roles in order to be adaptive to, to the needs at that moment in time. And also in Austria, we saw the multidisciplinary teams here that were essential in maintaining essential care services during crisis. Just like Natasha just said, we should never stop the delivery of primary care services, but make sure we maintain during whatever crisis essential service delivery. And then lastly, the integration of primary care and the key public health functions such as emergency preparedness, health surveillance and monitoring, disease prevention and health promotion is essential. It's through this integration that we can reduce the exposure to health risk during a crisis. Um, that we can also improve access to essential services and that we can empower populations to be involved in shared decision making. We do know, however, that many health systems are still struggling to, to correctly and effectively integrate primary care and public health services. But there are great examples, for instance, from India um, and from Spain um, and Colombia, what we've seen in the pandemic, that it is possible to do so. And when it does, when it's correctly integrated in a very functional and effective way, 
um, it's essential for improving, for instance, vaccination rates, uh, contact tracing, etc. So we've seen that also after a crisis, the skill in primary health care is to now um, adapt, adapt its service models, adapt to the innovations and sustain those innovations and continue to spread the learning in order to make future-proof health systems. And an example of such an innovation was, of course, the virtual services delivery. During the pandemic, it became essential that the majority of health needs were still taken care of, but not in an in-person fashion, but more in a virtual manner. And virtual care took many different shapes and forms. Um, we're now seeing that, indeed, we are still sustaining those innovations in a good way, but we have to overcome certain challenges, such as digital literacy, other technical issues. So the message here is that we should really boost uh, and invest in uh, digitalization of service delivery and strengthen further primary health care. And luckily, many countries are doing that as we speak. So in conclude, primary health care is at the front line during a crisis. It is also essential for providing health security in preparing and preventing crises. And in the aftermath of a crisis, it has a big role to play in adapting and learning. So, and it does so through its foundational roles of its multidisciplinary teams, its integration of primary care and public health functions, and through its empowerment of communities and populations. And that's where we should continue to nurture primary health care approach and to further invest in. Thank you very much for the attention. Okay. Thank you so much, Dion. So those are, those, those are the three pathways we want to delve into today with our panel discussion. So there are three pathways through by which primary healthcare lends resilience to the system. We've got the multidisciplinary teams that address the comprehensive health needs of the community with multidisciplinary skills. We've got the community engagement, which allows us that connection to community, especially to those vulnerable groups, to, where, to the places where the emergency usually hits first in vulnerable communities. And then we have that integration of primary, primary care and public health, which brings all of that together to ensure that the individual health approach and the population health approach are really brought together to lend resilience and strength to the system. So I'd like to ask our panelists to come up to the podium. And in the meantime, I'd like to just welcome the Honorable Minister of Health of Austria, Johannes Rauch, who will be giving closing remarks later on today. Please do come up to the podium. Thank you. Okay, I, I prefer to walk around a bit, so I'll roam instead of sitting on the seat. Uh, but I'll start perhaps with you, Ilana, as our policymaker from here, from Austria. And Austria has been involved in intense primary healthcare reforms for a long time now. And you've been investing in primary health care, not only uh, with domestic funds, but you've also managed to convince the European Commission to allocate funds actually earmarked for resilience with the Recovery and Resilience Facility into primary health care. So tell us a little, little bit about that, about the work in investing in primary health care and ensuring and investing in resilience. Yes, hello. Thank you very much. That's working, right? Um, thank you for this important question. Um, as we can see that uh, all over the world we basically face sim uh, similar challenges. So um, when we saw that actually primary healthcare is indeed the foundation for healthcare systems and uh, they are so important to keeping and maintaining these essential services that were mentioned before, um, we realized that, well, we should really do more than we have done until now. So, um, and that concerns primary healthcare in general. I think that's really important to outline. But when we realized that we could um, decide on certain priorities uh, within the recovery resilience facility, we decided that we want to boost and strengthen further primary health care units because, as mentioned before, the multidisciplinary settings, these team-based settings that showed us during the crisis that um, they really uh, were able to, to find solutions uh, within the teams to deliver services, to keep um, up the work they had done before, and uh, that was due to different reasons. One was um, the, the team, uh, which is based on uh, general practitioners, but even other healthcare workers and social workers, 
nurses. So um, the team setting enabled basically to keep going. If someone got sick, someone else was there to, to keep working. Um, and that uh, proved to be really shock resistant and resilient in times of crisis. Also the range of services, which we heard before, I mean, that was um, the continuation was uh, um, possible. Also the continuation of, for example, treating chronic, uh, chronically ill patients, which was really important. And I think that Johannes is going to uh, talk about that a little bit more from the practical side. Um, also the extended opening hours and the sheer size basically of these offices that enabled to separate between infected patients and non-infected patients to have different entrance and exit possibilities. All these things proved to be really important in these times of, um, you know, these challenging times. So when we saw that we could integrate that into recovery and resilience facility, we did that. And it's interesting maybe to mention that the focus there was not on health, even though it was the direct answer from the European Commission to get to, to in, increase the resilience of communities and member states. But the, the main focus was put on digitalization and sustainability, which is important, no question about that. But health was not on the top of the agenda and also not primary health care. And I think that's important uh, as a lessons learned. So for us, that's a really innovative means uh, to, um, to finance and fund um, innovative tools and instruments also, and uh, to put more focus on this uh, important topic of, of primary health care and especially multi-professional primary health care. Great. Thank you so much. So primary health care was not on the agenda, on the resilience agenda. So we're hoping that with this session and with further discussions, we, are, we can put it on, the, on that resilience agenda. You also mentioned multidisciplinary teams uh, with social workers, with deep GPs. This is a completely new way of working. And Johannes, you're at the front lines. You're in a multidisciplinary team in a primary health care unit. This is radically different from where, the, how you're used to working, how you were working before in a sort of more, sol more classical solo GP practice. Tell us a little, little bit about that. How is it different, the, the, the different ways of working, and how does it work in practice? What are some of the challenges and what are the, some of the things that work well? Um, this is working? Yes. Um, well, thank you for the question. I have the great advantage of having worked during the pandemic and before the pandemic as a solo GP and I changed to a team. Um, what are the definite ad advantages is that we get to adapt way more quickly we get to adapt to the new information that comes up more precisely, which is something I really, really enjoy working. Um, before that, I had one person taking care of reception, and that then was me and no one else. Now we get to even this out. We talk to each other, we say, okay, what do we have to deal with this week? Are there special challenges here? Um, I don't have to focus on everything that's happening. I can focus on the medical work, on the clinical decisions that I have to, uh, I have to take. Um, but I have the great advantage of having a team around me and I can delegate certain tasks when I see that it's not me the patient needs to see, but rather it should be a physiotherapist that you should be uh, seeing and then please come back to me. Another great advantage is, as was mentioned earlier, we could separate the chronic, chronically ill from those that just stepped up to the door and said, well, I'm not feeling well in my old office, well, it wasn't my office, it was just one entrance, one hallway, there was no real waiting area everything was mixed up together. And in the primary healthcare unit, we could separate this more easily because we had more doctors. We could put in a certain uh, time slot in the calendar and say, well, you all show up then, please. And the rest of them get their normal care, which is something I really enjoyed because it wasn't, well, it's pandemic, your chronic heart disease, I can't deal with it right now, I'm sorry. Because uh, that's not good, even, I mean, that's obvious. Um, another great uh, difference to me was how people are ready to step up to the challenge and take responsibility for what they're there for. So you use the potential of each and everyone included in that team to uh, provide healthcare and to tackle those things that are necessary, especially non-medical uh, personnel. If it wasn't for Petra, she's basically our uh, heart and soul organizing everything, she points out to us, here's a challenge, how do we deal with it? Because I get crowded up in this, and that's something I thoroughly enjoy working. Okay, great. So, you, so basically, 
you're saying it's better use of people's skills, more optimal use of people's skills, especially the skills beyond the clinical, which addresses some of the mental and the social health needs that uh, Natasha also uh, talked about, more flexibility. So what is, how does this impact on your job satisfaction on vis-a-vis uh, -vis how you were working earlier? Uh, greatly. I remember one day specifically, it was a Monday. As you can imagine, Mondays are usually quite intense. Uh, what happened is in the morning one of my colleagues got sick. Usually we were three doctors and uh, one of the nurses got sick, two receptionists and one doctor. So we had to even out and I remember that day specifically because in Austria it would be very likely that somebody starts complaining and complains the whole day. This did not happen. What happened was, okay, we got together for like two minutes and said, how are we going to deal with this? Um, uh, someone's going to go through the time slots and tell us who does not have to show up today, who needs to come up today, uh, who can take whose tasks. And I remember coming home the day instead of, uh, I started at seven in the morning and I uh, should have finished around two or three. I came home at seven, but I remember in the car, I was talking to a friend and I said, yes, it was an intense day but we did a great job and I really, really liked that. And it was the same for everyone in the team because it's not just resilience for each person involved in delivering care means that the whole system gets uh, more resilience altogether. And uh, yeah. A happy workforce means we've got a stronger and resilient health system. And we were talking about, Natasha mentioned also, the workforce crisis in Europe. So one way to deal with this is to also uh, have multidisciplinary teams, have more collaboration, working together, and this gives strength and lends that resilience to the health system. Because you mentioned, yes, the workforce, something that's also very different is we get to train more uh, young doctors in family medicine and get to show them how it can be done differently and get different inputs from different colleagues, which is something all of those who've worked for us and with us so far really, really enjoyed of these silos, of our medical curative silos, so that we can work beyond with health promotion and health prevention. One final question I have to you before I go to you, Margarita, is um, the, the point of the multidisciplinary teams, as you so nicely uh, mentioned, was also to provide a, a, a broader range of service, social care, mental health services, psychosocial care, etc. So it means more interaction with the community. Uh, tell us a little bit about how these primary health care units are trying uh, to have those links to community or bring in, uh, understand better the needs of the target population of your community? Well, it's definitely a topic in, in, in our unit. Uh, there were plans to uh, uh, make uh, fixed dates every two weeks with information events about uh, therapies, about nutrition, um, about topics that people might come up with in, 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 in our office or in the community. We were addressed, for example, by the local government regarding certain things. Um, the community engagement is something that's, I think, rather new in Austria, but there's, as for example, social prescribing, there's steps to, to, to improve that. Um, obstacles are, for example, um, legal issues, we have therapists who would like to go out with people and do group exercise or talk about certain things, but uh, sometimes it was hard to find a venue. I mean, especially during COVID, all these events were put at a halt. Um, but uh, questions that I hadn't thought of earlier was, our physiotherapist, well, I'd like to do that, but what if somebody slips and falls while we do our walking group? Am I gonna be, it's, it's gonna be my fault, what are we gonna do that? Are we gonna do if it's raining? Etc. Etc. It sounds small, but to that person it means, oh, oh my God, I'm, I'm the physiotherapist here in this town that uh, breaks people's legs when they do the group events. And they don't want that to happen, obviously. Um, uh, that's so far. Of, of course, during COVID, community engage engagement was a topic, not only vaccinations, but um, informations. We did not put out ads or anything of that kind, but doctors in the area referred to us regarding certain questions. And I think that was because we got our heads together and when information was new, we talked to each other and said, okay, is this, a is this approach good? Is this a best practice as we can do it now? And it means the world to you if you just have a minute or two of feedback to say, yeah, this makes sense. Maybe you're wrong here. Maybe we're all together wrong there. Let's go this way. Because this gives you this broader back in, in, in the day-to-day -day business.
which makes you more resilient. And as, as you mentioned, the RRF fund, we use that as well, especially for, again, non-medical personnel in uh, telephone training, in de-escalation, uh, in emergency training for the whole team, simulating an emergency in, in the unit. And uh, this makes everyone's job easier in, in the team. Community engagement in practice, not so easy. So it's a great theory, but as we see, sometimes there are legal hurdles and others, other practical hurdles that need to be overcome in order to really make it happen in practice. Um, and probably we need much more focus and much more investment in that area as, uh, as we move forward and developing, de develop primary health care in these units. Community engagement, this is your area, Margarita. You're a civil society activist, a member, a civil society member of the National Council for Health. Again, that's an official advisory body of the Ministry of Health of Portugal that was only set up recently in 2017 in order to bring civil society and communities and society together with decision makers and policy makers. So we'd like to know, is this something, is this an example we should draw on uh, in, for, in other countries in Europe? How does it work in practice? How have you felt that you've been able to actually give input into policy making, also in terms of the COVID crisis and providing resilience to the system? Over to you. Yeah, um, thanks you for uh, having me here to, to, and I hope that our experience in Portugal helps um, other, other places to, to, to adopt uh, ways of the community to, to be in, more engaged in terms of uh, health policies. How does it work? Well, I'm a I'm, I work in a patient organization. Uh, I work with children with cancer for about uh, 20 years. Um, and uh, I have been recently, uh, uh, two years, year and a half, so, uh, appointed to, the, to this council. It's an advisory council of the health ministry. Um, and uh, what we do, basically, we are, uh, let me go back. We, as uh, civil um, organizations, we are appointed by parliament uh, and uh, we have a mandate of four years and the next four years uh, there will be other organizations and they tend, uh, these organizations tend to be um, different, like I am a representative of children, uh, uh, sick children, there are elderly, elderly organizations and so on. On this uh, council there is also um, representatives of doctors, nurses, psychologists, biologists, so and of end of the, the, the council. So it's not only civil organizations, you have uh, uh, all, these, uh, all these people around. And uh, what we do is basically um, the, the ministry uh, calls us uh, to give uh, advice about a certain uh, legislation that's going to, 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 to be um, presented um, and we give a view. Uh, usually we give a view based on our own experience and on the, the expectations of community. Uh, so it's a way of involving the community in the, 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 this uh, legislation process, if you like. The other uh, tasks that we, we do is uh, we provide information to the public. So from time to time we do certain um, public presentations where we try to, pe to have uh, uh, people uh, to get more information to the people because we know that uh, uh, um, as much as people are better informed, uh, they will be, um, they will help the resilience of the, of the system, they will understand better the, the system. One of the problems we have in Portugal, for instance, and I believe it's not only in Portugal, is that uh, people tend to go much more to the hospitals because they trust hospitals in the, and not to the primary unit services because in Portugal, unfortunately, they are not yet all multidisciplinary like uh, we were talking, and um, so people rely more on hospitals, which creates a bottleneck. So it's very useful that we provide information about the type of services they can have in, in, in the unit uh, so that people will, be, uh, will trust more. All this is about trust. People need to trust the system. And this was critical during pandemic, as, as, as you know. Um, during the pandemics, uh, the council had um, mainly, the mainly involved was to give advice about uh, please do not forget about primary care, 
uh, which was uh, a, a very important message. Sometimes we were successful, sometimes we have not been successful. Uh, so there are, there are some, some, some areas. Uh, and as another example, we also, um, for instance, give advice a lot of times about please let the kids go to school. So something different from uh, health uh, concentration, but it was a major issue in our society in Portugal because the schools have been closed for about one year or so, and that this was a big problem and a major concern of, uh, of all the civil uh, organizations. Okay, so you were, the council was ensuring a balance between health security concerns and societal well-being. That was your, your role. But I would be curious to know, you, I mean, you mentioned that it's, a, it's an advisory body, the National Council for Health, to the Ministry of Health. How far are the council's deliberations and recommendations taken up in policy, or how far are they taken seriously in, the, in policy making in Portugal? Um, I believe they're taken seriously, um, but uh, they're not always taken on board. Uh, so I would say um, that we have uh, still uh, a work to do uh, in order to, for these uh, things to, to get more, more um, listened. Uh, uh, a lot. Uh, being a patient, coming from a patient organization, I'm used to fight uh, uh, a lot, as you can as you can imagine. So uh, I always uh, see this as a, 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 um, it, there is still a long way to go. Uh, although we have started, which is good. Uh, we have started. We are sometimes listened, uh, and I think that's the beginning. It's the beginning that one time uh, you lose, one time you win, and uh, and y you have to make an effort to be listened the next time. Okay, so this is uh, you know the big advantage, of course, that you have is that it is an official advisory body, so you have access to policymakers, and policymakers have access to you. So it's a first big step. Uh, in the right direction. Is this something we should be doing in other European countries? I'm looking at you, Ilana, in Austria. Is this something we should emulate, we should copy? What is Austria do to doing to ensure more community voice, civil society voice, and planning, policy making of the Austrian PHC stakeholder forum? Uh, Johannes mentioned social prescribing, which is a way to ensure uh, addressing non-medical needs of society through referrals um, and with the support of GPs and the health team. What is your take on that? Give us your reflections. Yeah, there are, there are many points and many important questions and I think we can learn a lot from Portugal actually. Um, I think we've tried to do it uh, in a different way basically. So one of the results of these RF funds, it's not going only in the funding of primary healthcare units or in strengthening existing units. It also goes in uh, making primary healthcare in general more attractive and strengthening the whole idea about primary healthcare and offering a platform also for the community and here I mean the primary healthcare community. So um, our public health in, uh, institute um, has established such a platform. Um, it's an online platform, obviously, but it offers a lot of different services, uh, including trainings, workshops, um, mentoring programs, like the list of offers are, is really, really long. And um, actually, they have launched quite recently also a new section exactly on community engagement and involvement, where it goes um, more into the idea how can it be practically um, implemented uh, also in primary healthcare settings such as the units. And here we have also um, collected already some ideas, uh, such as health cafes uh, with, with the community itself, where people from the community can be integrated in the ideas of the primary healthcare units. Um, we have a very big RIF um, project actually uh, with community nurses that is really important as well. It's not directly connected to our project, but there is a link. Um, we have cooperate. They have actually, not we have cooperation with self helping groups and, and you mentioned social prescribing. This is really in the in the first steps in Austria. We are working on a national concept, um, and here we have 24 
um, primary healthcare facilities, not only units, but in general, that are piloting on different projects when it comes to social prescribing. So that's actually quite interesting. Um, when we talk about so-called link workers who do this job that they try to go beyond health promotion and finding um, services and, and offers for people who have issues that cannot be solved with medication or shouldn't be. So link workers, I mean, the word says it all, link. We need to link between the health systems and communities. And where does that happen? That happens really in, in primary health care. And why does this link to resilience? It's because that's where the emergency hits first. That's where the, our, our weak spot is, and that's where we need to address uh, the health needs the most. So I'm going to just look at Bianca to, to see what we have from our online community to get to have them involved a little bit more. Go ahead. Yanka. We have some questions coming okay. in. And uh, people are really interested in the best practice models. Of course, we've heard about Austria. But maybe one of the question is, in which European country can we find the strongest primary healthcare system? And maybe um, to find some, uh, uh, what does it take to strengthen a primary healthcare throughout Europe? If uh, the speakers have some thoughts on that. I'll look to the panel if there's anything that you'd like to, to address, some strong primary health care systems. I mean, at the European Observatory, we do a lot of country comparative analyses. One of our star countries is actually Spain on primary health care. I wonder if we have anyone from Spain in the audience who might want to, uh, to talk about that uh, without putting you on the spot. Um, but also, um, you know, Austria now with the, with the huge investment in, in, uh, in primary health care. I think an important point here is in you know countries that are strong in primary health care in Europe, and this is something we also saw in the evidence analysis that we've been doing uh, for the primary health care primer, which we're going to launch in Astana, is that the one key factor that we see across the board is that you have to be in it for the long haul. This is not something that's going to happen overnight. These are countries that have invested over decades slowly by slowly, incrementally, building the multidisciplinary teams, building, train, retraining the workforce to address social care, mental care, to address uh, preventive and promotive care, to retrain together, to learn how to work together in multidisciplinary teams. And also, I think an important point here in this long-term vision of investing in primary health care is that primary health care is not just about the primary care level, it's also about hospitals and about specialized care and reorienting the way they work as well in support of primary care and in support of a system that is really oriented around the major health needs of the population. And I think this is an important point that we shouldn't forget. It doesn't happen overnight. This is something that does this takes really decades of investment. What other questions are coming? Or can I maybe give you a chance on the panel to answer? Sorry, go ahead. I would like to add to that too that, I mean, we have a long way to go, I think. It's not like that we are yet a best practice. Uh, but I think we have done important steps towards um, strengthening primary health care. And since Austria is quite a fragmented system, uh, it only works by cooperation and um, and having all the stakeholders on board, I really want to underline the importance of that because also having now these RF funds, it doesn't work just by having, we have 100 million euros to strengthen primary health care, but we need our partners, if that's the regions or the social security, to go the same direction with us. And I think that's really important. And that's how we try also to include um, in the decisions we take here uh, in the specific European Commission project, we try to involve all the stakeholders. And um, for the question how to strengthen it, I mentioned before um, in the RF, um, health was not on the top of the agenda, and I think that needs to change. We need to shift that, uh, this view, what health actually means and how it influences different sectors. We need to make the case for health within the resilience paradigm. We've got the Minister of Health here who has that task within his government. Johannes, go ahead. Um, what would help, I think, definitely is it make it easier to be trained in the actual environment that you're supposed to work in. Because until a few years ago, you were trained to become a GP and you worked in a hospital and then you left the hospital and then you were on your own. I have a family background, of course, as, as many doctors, but I often see my dad talk to me. He, he worked as a GP and he said, I would have loved something like this to transit from hospital care to patient care. And you mentioned fragmentation. Um, 
Literally, I can take a stone and throw it from the city limits of Vienna twice, and I might, I'm in my unit, but it's a different uh, region. So we cannot accept doctors that did their basic training in Vienna to finish it to become GPs in our unit. And of course, we have a lot of people that apply because it's easy for them to get there. But to do that, they have to come outside and work in a new hospital for a month and then do night shifts in that hospital while they work at our place. And many say, well, I'm not going to do that because after a month in that hospital, I'm going to know my way to the locker room, no one else, and then I'm supposed to do night shifts. So they say, I'd love to work here, but I can't. The, the practicalities of making this work. This is what, yeah, the problems of fragmentation. And the other issue with fragmentation is that you might foster inequalities with better primary health care, maybe just outside of Vienna, vis-a-vis -vis within Vienna. And then that is a weakness in the system, which, which then has that effect on weakening the system and weaker resilience. Margarita, any comments on this also in terms of in good, good practice models, best practice models for community engagement and civil society input? Well, uh, um, I think there, there was always different ways according to societies to make the community to, 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 to have an influence. The important thing is to create the tool, the adequate tool for that particular community to, to have some influence so that the, the, the whole system is created around the individual. Let excuse me about the commonplace, but that's the issue, is uh, that everything is created around the person, the, the individual. And uh, the, I, I don't think that, the, 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 for instance, the Portuguese experience I was talking about uh, uh, could be the solution for, everybody, for, for uh, all other places. What's important from my point of view is that a system is created to make the community be heard and uh, uh, back and forth. So, so, so um, and the, the information from the health system goes back to the community so that they can rely and 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 uh, and trust and, and trust it. So. Uh, this mechanism we use in Portugal is a mechanism. It's not perfect and it still has some way to go, um, but it's a mechanism. Thank okay, you. So you mentioned trust, which is so important to counter health system shocks. It's, uh, it's really at the heart of, of resilience and this is what the National Council for Health is attempting, attempting to do. I'll just look at Bianca. Anything else coming from online and otherwise we'll go to the floor? There's a theme that keeps appearing and it's the one that how can we make primary healthcare more interesting and attractive for health professionals? It's often not cool enough to work in primary healthcare. Not cool enough to work in primary healthcare. Ilana, tell us about primary care attractiveness and making it more attractive mm. for health professionals. Well, it's a topic that keeps us um, up also during uh, nights, I would say, because we really need to find the right moment where to like try to st uh, set steps towards uh, making towards strengthening primary health care. And obviously, it's really important also to um, show the opportunities already to students. Um, that's quite a way until they start working there. But it's uh, an important topic for us. We are here in, um, in touch also with the universities because we try to find the mix of what would be mandatory, basically, so that also those who don't believe that uh, uh, primary health care could be a uh, career choice, that they could be interested. And in addition, also to, to foster this multi-professional learning. And there are some universities who are already trying to put an example, but uh, definitely there is more we need to do. Um, but I think that Johannes mentioned it. I mean, uh, there are the younger generation, it seems at least, really wants to work like that. They want to work in a team. They want to have the exchange. They want to talk about their daily work. And they also want to have the opinions and, um, of the other healthcare workers. So I think that um, it's, it's a challenge, but we are trying to also find here some solutions. And also here the platform is trying to offer services like the mentoring I mentioned, because here the idea would be that some um, more mature uh, healthcare professionals would mentor and tutor younger ones. 
and explain them how can they, um, what are the advantages also to work in, in team settings. Okay, so to make primary healthcare cool, we need to work on the policy side. We need to have more multidisciplinary teams. Johannes, tell us about that. You're a cool person, you came up here on motorbike. <laughs> Is primary healthcare cool? Is working in multidisciplinary cool? Teams cool? It's awesome. Um, no, um, well, of course it is. Um, making it cool, it sounds, well, we don't have to deal with it, we have to. And I think um, I also enjoy that in my work, sometimes we do have students, we have a cooperation, and this is not, this is not a joke that happened to me. Um, I, we had a student here from, from Graz at, at, at our unit for a month, and about half a year later, I was in a pub in Graz, it's just two hours from where I work, and I'm sitting there talking to my now wonderful girlfriend, and all of a sudden somebody taps me on the shoulder at 1 a.m. in the morning and goes, hi, and I say, hi, who are you? I, I did not remember him, that's sad, but he said, I just wanted to tell you, I had no idea that you can work as a GP like this, I had no idea that this is possible in medicine, about all the things I did in my training during my uh, rotations at medical university, this was by far the best. And I'm definitely considering doing that, and I had no idea I would do that before. So I figured, okay, we did something right, and if, if this gets a hold, and in, in Graz they know it, they introduce students into the settings, because they know 20, I think it was a few years ago, 20% of the people consider, of the students consider uh, working as a family doctor. After they're doing rotations for a month, it's about 40. And then we get closer to the number that we might need and show them actually because during med school you're rotating through specialty and specialty and specialty and everything gets the same importance may it be a disease that you may not ever see during your entire career or something that you see 15 times a day and to actually give them that that approach and tell them okay have that in mind but this is what you really need to deal with this is what you need to be good at and you have a team that helps you to provide that you don't have to stop at a certain point you can keep going with you know your team wow. okay so really making primary care attractive this is what it's all about that showing what it can do showing its potential and showing well how fun it can be to work in multidisciplinary teams and to work collaboratively and to reach out to communities so I'm going to go to the floor and I'd like to I'd like to first talk to my dear friend Rupa Dutt. I will give you the floor in a second, but I have a good friend here, so I'd like to give her the floor of Rupa. As many of you know, well, congratulations on the Austria chapter launch of Women in Global Health, uh, is the executive director of Women in Global Health. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about equity, because we know that inequities are a weak spot in the health system. Inequities is really where, as I mentioned repeatedly, where communities where vulnerable communities sit and which is where emergencies hit and one of the biggest inequities that we know of is gender inequity so tell us a little bit about how how we can address gender equity and how that especially through the primary health care approach can give us and lend us resilience to the health system over to you Rupa. Thank you, Deepa, and I really appreciate that. And um, uh, before I kick off, I just have to say that uh, uh, two decades ago, <laughs> I found primary health care cool. I was a youth delegate um, to the Almata um, Conference 30th de de uh, Declaration. At that time, I was a medical student. I went on to then really promote primary health care in the International Federation of Medical Student Associations. I almost uh, got named the Almaty Gang. <laughs> and I uh, carry that badge proudly. Um, also went to the next um, anniversary. And as I uh, hear the youth piece, I think it's really important to emphasize that because young people are a vehicle for change. I say let's not only reach out to medical students, but think about the nursing students, um, all the other, the pharmacists, all the other ones that we don't uh, tend to count that are part of uh, the primary health care vision. And I'd also like to say on the theme, just building on, is primary health care should not be optional. I practice, um, uh, actually my first clinical role outside of uh, residency was primary health care, so I really believe in the, the title of the session. But I was asked to particularly focus on the theme um, 
of inequities. And uh, I hope this continues as particularly um, a theme throughout uh, the, the Gastein Forum because we kicked off with the Women in Global Health Austria launch. So I'd say let's make every conversation gender responsive and looking at things from intersectionality and equity. Um, so a few things I want to highlight is we are in the fourth year of a pandemic that led to death, sickness, patient backlogs, economic devastation. We've heard a lot of that. Um, I'm coming directly from the UN high-level meetings that took place on universal health coverage, um, as well as pandemic preparedness. And um, it was good to see primary health care as the foundation of UHC coming out as a theme. Um, and particularly on the gender equity aspects of it, first, um, we need to acknowledge that for millions of people, um, they are going to see a health worker, um, whether that is a nurse or a community health worker who's uh, a woman. So for majority of them, the only health worker they're going to see is a woman. And for many of them, these female community health workers around the world are currently underpaid or unpaid. We heard some examples um, that even apply in the European context. Uh, the pandemic shone a light on the contributions of these women who went door to door as health experts in communities. They did contact tracing, um, eventually administrating vaccines. And the pandemic also exposed the conditions that many work under, often without personal protective equipment and frequently facing violence, harassment, and stigma. So last year, women in global calculated that at least six million um, of these women are unpaid or grossly underpaid in formal health system roles. And these women subsidize health for us with their unpaid work. Um, and when disease outbreaks, they hold the line um, from disease um, not spreading, especially to better resource countries. So currently, health system resilience is weakened by relying on unpaid labor. And this is a global health issue that we must all address collectively together. And it's a foundation for primary health care. The second issue, which I think has already come up a few times on this panel, uh, but to really drive home, Women in Global Health released a new report uh, last Friday at the UNGA on the Great uh, Resonation. We um, are putting on spot uh, the, uh, the country Canada, but this applies to many, is that one in five Canadians, um, which is about 6.5 million people, do not have access to a family physician or nurse practitioner. Um, so again, repeating that, one in five. Patients want a primary health care practitioner who knows them, their history, their family, effective primary care, but that's built on relationships of trust. Trust came up uh, many times. However, in um, the situation Canada is not used. It's, part, it's a bigger part of global shortages of trained health workers all around the world. At the start of the pandemic, WHO estimated a global shortage of 15 million um, health workers, and we know that those numbers are probably uh, rising, particularly acute in low and middle income countries. Uh, but as we hear about the great resonation in high income countries, I want to talk to you about what's happening um, in low income countries, as we know um, that there is a great migration as well. Many of the health workers are resigning because of burnout, um, particularly nurses and midwives. Um, there is a gender component. We've heard uh, in today's conversations about how women have had a triple responsibility uh, providing um, care at home, uh, providing care for their communities, as well as added longer shifts during the pandemic. Um, so this is a real equity issue, and it's often um, the women that do not have a seat at the decision-making table. So when you look at national COVID-19 task teams, uh, Deepa and I have had a chance to work on a paper together on this. Uh, when we looked at global task teams around the world, 115, uh, we found that um, only 5% had gender parity. 85% of them were majority men. So women's expertise was being left out, and especially women that are at the front line. And my final point is, uh, on that exact point, women deliver uh, health, men lead it. Women hold 70% of uh, the roles, um, yet only get 25% of senior leadership roles. Women are leaving the health sector. Um, they feel their professional knowledge was ignored um, and that mistakes were made. And we're calling for a radical reorientation of Army healthcare. So radical means, um, again, taking the message already said earlier about having 50% of leadership roles go to women. And I think that is very much about making it cool, keeping the buy-in. If women feel like they're part of the system and they can change the system and transform it, they will stick through the roles. Um, and finally, this year, uh, prim primary health care is pivotal for all pivotal for health systems, and it's really come up the amount of engagement, uh, workforce diversity, health education, resource alloca allocation, and digital innovations. Um, so back to you, Deepa. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rupa, for highlighting this. Work, the workforce crisis is a gendered 
workforce crisis. So if we want to strengthen primary health care, we need to take consideration of that. We need to look at the fact that women's expertise is left out and women are leaving the health sector and we need to address that. Thank you so much. And I'll hand over to the colleague here before I saw a couple of hands in the back. Can you just introduce yourself briefly and ask your question? Sure, thank you. My name is Inga Dreger. I'm with the vaccines company Novavax. And I was going to um, ask a question about um, incentives um, uh, in the in the system. But before I ask my question, I just wanted to respond that your thoughts were so um, striking to me. And I just want to underscore that uh, in Germany, the vast majority of medicine students uh, are female and the number is growing. But out of 38 university hospitals in Germany, only one has a female chief medical officer. So I, I found that um, uh, extremely interesting. Um, so I was going to ask, um, how um, financial incentives play a role also in the question of uh, general medicine is cool because I only know from the market I, I work in that um, reimbursement for physicians can uh, vary vastly between uh, the area you work in and also the specialty you work in. And I was just wondering um, if, uh, apart from the ways of working, of uh, teamwork and et cetera, also this question of incentives may also play a role in the choice of um, specialty. And um, then also I wanted to ask you, because I think the perspective of the patients is something that we all always claim. We want to hear more and want to incorporate more. But also I can um, just reflect from, from, from Germany that um, uh, the, the council of uh, uh, patients is very often sought out, but is never reimbursed fairly because this is uh, volunteer roles a lot of the time. And I was just wondering how in Portugal um, this is um, handled and it's not just an honorary um, role or like if you're reimbursed for your time. Okay, so we have the question about the money that's already always important. And then a question about how do we deal with volunteer, volunteerism really in the Sec the associative sector and the sec civil society sector. So maybe Johannes first and then Margarita. Um, about incentives, um, also, uh, yes, we tend to uh, talk about how it's, it's nice to work there, but I think the, the first step would be to actually get people to know what they would work in. Um, uh, incentives financially would be to make it easier to get people to work there of all uh, healthcare workforces, because we're also struggling to look for nurses to work with us because they will mostly say, well, I'm going to get paid way less. If I do a few night shifts, I'm, I'm going to earn way more. Um, so that's not an option for me. Luckily, we have three great nurses with us. Um, uh, two of them are of the area. And for them, it was a thing of, I want to have time for my family. I don't have night shifts anymore, but I get to use my potential there, which we try to actively uh, encourage because what they learn, we all profit from. Everybody does. Maybe. I just wanted to ask, Alana, did you want to say anything about the about financial intensive? I think that in general, that's always a, and it has a role that I think doesn't matter what type of work you're doing, uh, acknowledgement and also financial acknowledgement is, is an issue. But when we come to the ROF funds, we, um, we use that only for investments in the primary healthcare unit itself. So it would be medical equipment, non-medical equipment, it would be trainings, and all these aspects are incentives as well. I think that it makes sense, and if I heard right, you said that you use kind of some of the trainings already, and I think that's also a sign of acknowledgement when you say you're important and you need, you, you know, we offer or give you the opportunity to do these courses and, and trainings. So I think it's never a yes and no answer, it's a combination, I would say. So using money wisely for non-financial incentives as well. Margarita, this is the question of volunteerism, this is a big one. Um, yeah. How do we get work with volunteers yeah. because, yeah. Um, the, the, the thing is, uh, without taking the, the emphasis on the importance of voluntary work, which is very important, of course, for all these organizations, I, I, I'm a strong believer about them being more and more professional. Uh, um, uh, so that we can do a job. Uh, I am a professional. I, I work, uh, I've been working for 20 years 
almost, uh, on this civil organization as a profession. I'm not a volunteer. And I believe that um, a certain amount of people have got to dedicate their, their time and be paid as professional um, uh, so that we can do a proper job. And there, are, there is as well a, ty a, um, a type of work that has to be done and uh, is better done by voluntary work. But I think there is a place for both. And we cannot rely only on voluntary work uh, in order to do uh, um, what we have to do. It's every day more demanding. You need to, have to be... Uh, knowledge, you need to have knowledge about um, medical issues, law issues, uh, uh, so, so management issues, so communication, uh, and so you have to have a lot of, uh, uh, of knowledge, and so you cannot rely only on. Uh, but that's uh, as well. That's my view. Uh, that's uh, uh, in Portugal. Uh, what we have seen increasingly is that. The, the, the organizers, organizations are getting more and more professional. So, uh, although they have voluntary work, they are more and more professional. Um, regarding this council, the National Health Council, we uh, act on this council as kind of volunteers. We are not paid to be there, but we are paid by our organizations to be there, um, to, to a large extent. So, uh, my, the time that I dedicate to the council is kind of uh, rewarded by my own organization. I don't know if I did answer your question. Okay, so this is a big topic. We could go on and on about it, but I think the message is clear. We need professionalized civil society, but there's also a place for volunteers and community workers. I see a lot of hands in the back. Anita, go ahead. Do you have a... Yes. You can introduce yourself and ask your question. Yeah, thank you so much. My name is Anita Gottlob. I work at the Austrian uh, Public uh, National Health Institute. So I have a question for each of you. And I wanted to ask, in terms of learnings from the pandemic, what is one area that you think still needs improvement and attention that has not been, been tackled yet to um, improve preparedness and resilience in terms of future shockwaves for primary health care. Okay, thanks a lot. I think it suits quite nicely with the previous one, so um, and I will speak quickly. My name is Andrea Schmidt. I'm the head of the Competence Center at the Austrian National Public Health Institute, Competence Center for Climate and Health. And I would like to um, maybe um, create a nice synergy also with the previous question and ask um, about climate resilience and how um, primary health care can also help us prepare and anticipate the consequences of the climate crisis as well as respond uh, to climate change in general. I know that um, there have been some structural incentives on sustainability in the primary health care um, funds uh, in the European resilience funds, but also um, in terms of how do you see the role of professionals working in primary health care, of the different professions in responding to climate change. If you think about the heat waves that hit Europe uh, last year, uh, 60,000 people died due to heat-related deaths. And um, I'm, I'm wondering what is your uh, opinion on that? Is it, maybe also a question to, to the colleague from Portugal in how these different professions can also help prepare patients better and act as multiplicators um, for climate resilience. Thanks. Editor-in-Chief of the Lancet Regional Health Europe from Munich. So my question is more forward-looking. Uh, are there any research areas or gap in knowledge in terms of resilience and primary health care where more research is needed that will help in enhancing resilience of primary health care? Are there areas where more uh, data-driven approach or research is needed I'll give each of you uh, um, one or two minutes to respond to whichever question you'd like to, and then we will give the floor to the Honorable Minister of Health. Go ahead, Margarita. Well, uh, I 
Sorry. Um, I have no, uh, not a lot of knowledge about cl climate uh, change, so uh, um, that was uh, one of the questions. But uh, I, what, I, what I see uh, is that, like in any other crisis, if you have the involvement of the people, uh, you will be able to, to, have a, to create a better system. And climate is as well about the resilience of the system. Uh, it's a crisis. Uh, it's going to happen. We all know it's going to happen, although we weren't aware about the pandemic as, as much as we were about climate. Uh, and I don't think we are being uh, that well prepared, which may uh, link to the other question, which is uh, we still have a lot of lessons to learn from um, our previous experience. Uh, to, to So uh, kind of the multidisciplinary approach is one of the, the, the lessons that I believe, at least in Portugal, we have not learned enough, and that would be a, an important one for the climate for the climate area, I, I believe. Sorry. The climate is important for resilience. Johannes. I'm going to try and, sorry, I'm going to try and combine these questions. For me, it all comes down to monitoring in the community. It's something that we're not used to yet, I think. It's something that we do not learn. Um, I think in none of the, the teams or none of the team members, neither nurses, nor therapists, nor doctors, were trained to treat a problem that occurs. Um, be it climate, be it uh, another crisis, um, it all comes down to monitoring and I would see it in each member of the team to be, I call it the whiskers, just like the cat, you know, goes around and sees, checks out his surroundings and knows what's happening in the community because this in the end instills trust because if we reach out to the community to see what's, what's bothering you, I would like to know how this can be done efficiently and how this can be done without being too patriarchic about it, saying, what do you need? Come and see me, but okay, what's going on? How can we deal with that? Because that's something that I do not know from my training uh, per se, and others don't either. And this is something that I think um, patient institutions will greatly um, or be happy to see, actually reach out and say, what can we do? Not this one set of skills, apply it. Be it up here in the mountains or in the big city, it's not the same thing. Okay, so community monitoring also as a potential gap in terms of learning and, uh, and research. Ilana, give us your final words. Thank you. Uh, I'm also trying to combine that basically. Um, the, what we saw during the crisis already was that primary healthcare units are very adaptive. So I think that's something that is important also when we look towards uh, future crisis and already happening crisis, uh, such as the climate crisis. But um, the primary healthcare units or the primary healthcare area itself is not, I think, isn't the, the big part where we need to uh, have measures uh, adopted. It's more the, the healthcare sector with the hospitals where bigger units basically have to um, contribute uh, to the solution. Um, we have here a European uh, program, uh, not with the RRF, but with a technical support instrument, where we're trying to greening the healthcare sector, actually in cooperation with the Public Health Institute also here. Um, and when it comes to, to lessons learned, what, uh, where we need to, uh, you know, put another focus on, I think that I could, um, uh, connect that to the question about um, female um, female workforce. Uh, a lot of women are general practitioners, and uh, beyond that, obviously, also working as healthcare workers. Uh, but when we look at the primary healthcare units and the founders, there are still more male uh, founders than female founders, and we are actually trying to highlight that there you have a possibility to integrate also family and, and uh, career. You have more flexible working hours, but there needs to be more information and uh, more basically um, uh, also training in that direction to see that there is potential female leaders are needed also in these units. We don't always have to think so huge. It, is, uh, it would be important also to, to have female leaders here. And, um, and when it comes to data, well, evaluation, that is something that we are looking in, uh, also of the primary healthcare units and their impact. And, um, and on data, I think that social prescribing is something that we need to look into as soon as we have something to look into. And we are still in the pilot project. So data and monitoring evaluation, these are all important factors in order to look uh, into the future and prepare future steps also ahead. Okay, so 
again, monitoring in the community, female leadership to lend resilience. Thank you very much to our esteemed panel. A round of applause for them while we ask the, um, the minister to please come up to the podium. So don't be afraid. Another three minutes, it's better to listen to the panelists than to the minister. Um, or we, we could, usually we can talk about another hour about the fragmentation of the Austrian health system or the difficulty uh, to reform the Austrian healthcare law. It uh, was a big and a long journey. But uh, I would thank to the speakers and the, to the panelists uh, because very valuable contributions and insights in the system. And a special thank to Johannes. I guess we have to engage you, uh, bring you to the Austrian University, and if there is anybody with any doubts if it's better to work uh, in a primary healthcare system or on another place, uh, you're the master to explain. Uh, it's the best place to work. And it is very, uh, very close to the reality. And it's so clear working in a team on the same level, um, in cooperation. Uh, um, it's, you are able to um, talk with, to your co colleagues at the end of a day, on a hard day, especially this Monday you talked about. Uh, it's such another thing. My wife is a retired doctor. She worked for 30 years as a doctor in a single, in a single setting. And often she came home, 100 patients a day, completely tired, uh, not enough time to talk to the people. And she is... Uh, a front runner for the primary healthcare system in, in Austria uh, because she said it's the future. It is the future. And uh, the, the healthcare system will completely change. And how it changes to a better way or to a worse way, it's in our hand. It's in our hand. So it's my, I try, I, I say I try, I try to do this health reform because I believe uh, if we aren't able to change the system in a good way, we lose everything. There will be reducing of, uh, of doctors, of uh, uh, hospitals and so on. And yes, we need more money. Yes, of course, we need more money in the system. We, we are talking about one, one billion euros a year in the health system, one billion euros a year in a, in a care system. Uh, but if we aren't able to do the reform, and to build more primary healthcare centers, especially all over Austria, uh, our target is to build about 120 primary healthcare uh, um, um, units. Actually, we have about 45, I guess, or so. Um, we aren't able to run the, the system anymore. So I'm, I'm sure we have an opportunity to, uh, to, to make, make things better if we are able uh, to, 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 to reform the system. Um, and it's dominated by white old men, as I am one. Um, but we have to talk with... Uh, um, because <laughs> you, we have a talk uh, uh, in the session before. Uh, the system is dominated by white old men and uh, the women are in the, in, the, in, the, in the care system always and not in the leading positions because we, and we have to change it, uh, it also. And joint action, cooperation, uh, practical uh, implementation of primary health care. Uh, this is uh, a, a, the most important, one of the most important points of our health reform. So I try my very best. Uh, the next two months there will be uh, challenging because in this um, uh, very strange system in Austria, we have a lot of players in the system and not uh, all of the players are willing to do a reform, I can tell you. Um, it's very complicated, but uh, um, I, 
uh, in the last in one of the last sessions we had a, um, a little bit um, how can I take uh, how can I call it um, an interesting discussion with the with the players and they want always they want more and more and more and more money in the hospital system and I say uh, sorry guys. Uh, I can spend billions and billions in the hospital systems if we aren't able uh, to, to have a better system outside the hospitals. We aren't able to run the systems any longer. So, this is my situation. Uh, yeah. And uh, let me one, one thing to the budgets and to the um, fightings. Uh, with my own Minister of Finance for the, <laughs> for the Euros. Um, it's, it's, a stupid, it's a stupid discussion because when we build buildings, railroads, streets, uh, we all are talking about investments. Investments, good costs. If you're talking about health system, care, uh, social workers, there are costs and bad costs, and we have to uh, to change this mindset. They are investments too, investments, investments in our future, in our society. Because if we didn't invest, uh, uh, we didn't um, this is this investments. We lose everything. We lose uh, our our population. We lose uh, uh, democracy, and we lose solidarity. So. I, my speech is, uh, it's, there are good costs, there are investments, so let's invest in our health system, in our care system. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I thank the co-sponsors, the WHO European Center for Primary Health Care, the Austrian Ministry of Health, and thank you all to the audience for having come. Thank you. Have a good evening.